Well, we got into Ireland a couple of weeks ago, as I say, to a church there. And uh, the previous Sunday, the pastor had, had a word of knowledge to someone with a back condition. They were healed in the meeting. And then the mirac even more miraculous thing was the next day, uh, someone who had not been in the meeting had been healed of a back condition at the exact time that they were praying for the person in the meeting. So, you know, God is on the move. We've got a God of miracles. Amen. No other God is a God of miracles like our Lord, is he? And uh, this morning, we're going to look at, um, uh, I mean, I discarded about five Christmas messages that I've used over the years and things and just felt the Lord give me a fresh message for today. And today, we're just going to look at two miracles, not one, okay? Two miracles uh, in the um, run-up to the Christmas story. So if you'd like to turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 1, and whilst you're turning to, to Luke chapter 1 or looking it up on your um, gadgets, whatever you use nowadays, um, I just felt as I was travelling down from Colchester this morning, uh, the Lord just gave me some fresh words to an old refrain and uh, I, I can now see the significance of it having been in the meeting with you this morning. And it goes, it goes like this, Mary believed, Mary believed that all things are possible, Mary believed, Mary believed, Mary believed all things are possible, Mary believed, and now we can sing and he believed, and he believed that all things are possible, and he believed, help us believe help us believe that all things are possible help us believe and uh, picking up in verse 5 then from Luke chapter 1 that the words of that song if you forget everything else this morning that encapsulates, I believe, what the Holy Spirit is one to encourage us, us to believe for impossible situations today. And in verse 5 of Luke chapter 1, and I'm using the New International Version, we read this. At the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. We'll find that as we continue to read, they had been praying fervently for a child because particularly in that culture it would have been treated as a disgrace to not have a child once when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to be the one to go into the temple of the Lord and burn the incense and when the time for the burning of incense came all the assembled worshippers they were also praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he, notice, saw him. Angels are not sort of female fairies, okay? We, we do have a problem with some of our nativity scenes, don't we? Angels are awesome creatures that appear to be male. Zechariah was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. Wow. Hmm. Fits in with what we've just been hearing, doesn't it? Uh, of that testimony. 
He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, but how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And in the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel again, this time to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. But Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who has said, was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Now, in what I share this morning, please hear me, I have no wish whatsoever to take away from the uniqueness of Mary's amazing promise from God and the way that God used her. However, I believe that Elizabeth's words recorded in that last verse that I just read are a reminder to us all of the importance of believing what the Lord specifically speaks to us as blessing comes from our believing. We've seen testimony of that this morning. Another word for believing in the scriptures is to have faith. And there's at least four times in the scriptures where we're told that the righteous will live by faith in Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. All say the righteous, that is Christian believers who have been made righteous through a personal faith in the virgin birth and death and resurrection of Jesus 
are not just saved by faith, but we, which guarantees our eternal destiny, but we are to live by faith. So it must be important if it's in the scriptures at least four times. We, we are to live believing in what God says to us and not just reliant on our physical senses. You know, our five physical te- senses, what we see, touch, hear, smell, and taste. We're not just to be dependent on them alone because as Deuteronomy 8.3 says, mankind is just not intended to live just by bread, just by natural food alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, by every spoken word of God. And when Jesus quoted that verse, some of you will remember from Deuteronomy, and he used it against the devil during his time of temptation in the Judean wilderness, the word translated in Matthew 4.4 as word is the Greek word rhema, meaning a specific word relevant spoken words to you for your situation as believers we are to live by the precepts principles and promises that are written in God's word in the scriptures but not just but we're also to live believing in and for the specific things which the Lord has specifically spoken to us personally And also, of course, the things that he speaks to you corporately as a church. Time won't won't permit me to teach extensively on the different ways in which the Lord speaks specifically to us. But what, what I'm talking about this morning in regards to these rhema words are those occasions when maybe someone says something in a preach. Or by a prophetic word. Or even during a conversation. Or the line of a song or when reading the Bible, and the words, as it were, speak directly to you. They go down deep into your heart, into your inner being. And a bit like how we've just read, Elizabeth's baby leapt in her womb, it's as though something leaps inside of you, you know and you believe it was God that has just spoken to you. And you don't doubt it or dismiss it. You don't try and rationalise it away. You believe, you know As it were, as one person put it, you know in your knower that God has just spoken to you. For as Jesus taught in the parable of the sower, as recorded in Mark chapter 4, the seed of God's words which falls into good ground is that which is not just heard, but that which is accepted by a person with a heart which is not overrun by the worries of life, or the deceitfulness of wealth, or the desire for other things. For the seed of God's word to yield a good harvest in your life and in my life, the words spoken to us must be accepted. They must be received in faith, for it's faith, which we're told comes from hearing the Lord speak to us. It's faith which gives Hebrews 11, 1 tells us, substance to our hopes. That's the New King James Version says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. You see, biblical, biblical hopes are not just vague hopes, like I hope the sun will shine tomorrow. Biblical hope is based on what God has said. And it's faith that gives us substance to the things we hope for. The NIV version, I think it is, says it makes us sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see with our physical eyes. The writer of the book of Hebrews, in speaking of God's people Israel at the time of Moses, he says how they all heard God's promise to them, but it didn't benefit them. They didn't receive the fulfillment of God's promises. They didn't, because they didn't receive it, the scripture says, in faith. They didn't receive in faith. Hebrews 4 2, what God had said to them. In the passage of scripture, which I've just read, of Luke's account of the events which led to the coming of God's promised Saviour on that first Christmas, we have the example of Zechariah who did not believe in faith. God's specific promise to him. But we also have 
the example of Mary who did receive in faith God's specific rhema word to her. And I want to consider these two contrasting examples to help us understand more fully the importance of faith. For as Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Firstly, I think it's noteworthy and pertinent to point out that the scripture is very clear that Zechariah was a faithful servant of the Lord. He faithfully served as a priest. It's perfectly possible to be a churchgoer, to serve the Lord, but actually to be uh, falling into unbelief, a bit like Zechariah did at times. Luke tells us that he, he Zechariah, kept God's commandments. And yet, when God specifically spoke to him, and we know from the scripture, it was even in answer to prayer. It was even through an angel. I mean, imagine if an angel stood in front of you, you'd think that would help you believe. But Zechariah didn't believe what God was promising him. And so, to prevent him from talking negatively about this, Zechariah became dumb. He was unable to speak until God had brought about what he had promised. Because, you see, the birth of John, who became known as John the Baptist, was so important in God's purposes, God brought about the fulfilment of his promise in the birth of John, despite Zechariah's unbelief. Sometimes God does that kind of thing. But nevertheless, it is important we understand the general principle of God's kingdom, which was expressed by Elizabeth in verse 45 that we read, namely, that to be truly blessed by God, it's important that we believe that what the Lord says to us will be accomplished, which was, of course, what happened for Mary, who, unlike Zechariah, believed what God has specifically said to her through his angelic messenger. You see, scriptural faith is not like natural human kind of faith which everyone has, whether you're saved or unsaved. An example might be if you come in this morning and you say, if I sit on that chair, I believe it will hold my weight. Now, I've heard preachers use that as an example of faith, but it's not an example of faith. Not biblical faith, okay? Because you see, uh, biblical faith is the God kind of faith. We might call it script, a spiritual faith. It belongs to the invisible realm. It's of the heart based on what God says. It's not based on what our physical senses tell us. Your physical senses and your experience tells you that uh, that chair will bear your weight. But that, that's just natural faith to, to make the contract. It's not the kind of faith the Bible talks about. When the Bible talks about faith, it's talking about what God has promised, but you can't yet see it with your physical eyes. Let me give you an example. I believe absolutely emphatically that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I've never seen it with my physical senses in my place. But based on what God has said, I believe, and I no doubt many of you do, if not all, that you are absolutely confident that when you die, you'll go to heaven. That is an example of biblical faith. As Moffat's translation of Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith means that we are confident of what we hope for, convinced of what we do not see. You see, faith is not of the mind, but of the heart. It's an inner conviction that makes us certain of the things that we do not yet see in the natural physical realm. Faith makes us certain, sure, confident of what we do not experience yet in the natural realm. And like many of us, I would suggest, it would seem that Zechariah had difficulty in believing what God promised him. A son born to his wife Elizabeth in old age. Because his physical senses told him that was impossible. I mean, let's, let's, let's put it in context. Luke was a medical doctor. We were reading Luke's account. I think he puts it rather kindly in verse 7 when he says they were both well on in years. 
I think what he's really saying was the odds were stacked against them. He may have even been saying Elizabeth was past the natural age of childbearing. But true faith is not based on what your natural mind tells you, but on what God tells you. Zachariah, from the scriptures, wasn't the only one who found it difficult to believe without seeing some evidence in the visible realm. In a similar way, you might remember one of Jesus' disciples, namely Thomas's faith, that also seemed to be based on physical evidence. Remember how after the resurrection, when the disciples told Thomas that they'd seen the resurrected Lord, his response, recorded in John chapter 20, was, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger where the nails were, I will not believe it. He was saying, unless I see and touch, his believing was based on his physical senses of sight and touch. And although Jesus acceded to his request, he let him see and he let him touch. Christ's words to him reveal how Jesus wanted him and indeed us to have true faith. For John 20, 27 records how Jesus urged Thomas to stop doubting and believe. The New King James expresses it even more clearly. He says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And the old authorised version says, be not faithless, but believing. To have true faith I would suggest to you, based on scripture, is important. Thomas was trying to live solely in the natural realm, which is not pleasing to God. For, as I said earlier, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, true faith, based on what God says, it's impossible to please God. And thus, Jesus went on to say to Thomas, recorded in John 20, because you have seen me, you've believed, but blessed are those who have not seen with their physical eyes and yet have still believed. Friends, if you believe in the Lord here today, you are blessed because you believe, but you haven't seen with your natural senses, but you believe what the scripture reveals. Amen? Thomas trusted in his physical senses. His so-called faith was, was a worldly, natural faith and not the true kind of faith that the Lord wants us to live by. In contrast to Thomas and Zachariah, however, Mary showed clear evidence that she truly had faith in what God promised her. But you might be thinking, but hang on a minute, Roy. She asked, how will it come about as I am a virgin? But I do not believe, when you dig into scripture, that that was a sign of unbelief. It was more her wondering, just how is God going to bring this about? <coughs> and maybe, just maybe, the one or two here this morning, God has spoken specific things to you, and you too may wonder, but how can that possibly happen? Well, the answer friends, is similar to the answer given to Mary, namely, from verse 35 of Luke, the power of the Most High through the activity of the Holy Spirit will overshadow your impossible situation. For, as verse 37 says, nothing is impossible with God. A literal translation of the Greek text is every spoken word of God has power. If God has said it, he will do it. He'll bring it about, not necessarily in the way we expect or the timing we might hope for, but he will bring it about. Like Mary, who believed what God said over what her mind and circumstances told her, Paul in his letter to the church in Rome, cites Abraham as an example to us of someone who showed true faith in believing God for the promise made to him. 
Genesis 15 verse 6 says that Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. However, although Abraham initially believed God's promise that his offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky, we're told that after 10 years without his wife bearing him a child, he gave in to the battle in his mind. That's often where the battle is. We know something in our heart, but our mind is telling us something different. And Abraham gave in. He, 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 his mind was telling him the clock is ticking. And at 86 years of age, Abraham agreed with his wife to take matters into their own hands. And he took her maid servant as a second wife. And a son was born through her to Abraham called Ishmael. But Ishmael was not the fulfillment of God's promise. At that time in his life, Abraham, I would suggest to you, was much like Zachariah. He believed his circumstances over what God had said. But true faith believes what God says, even when our circumstances contradict that. But sometimes there's a battle that goes on within us. And sometimes, as for Abraham, the fulfillment of God's promise to us can take a long time in coming. Think of Joseph in the Old Testament, how many years he had to wait for God to bring about what God had promised to him. And at such times, we need to remember that Hebrews 6.12 points out that the promises of God are received through not just exercising faith, but the scripture says through faith and perseverance. Some translations say patience. Put the two together. The promises of God are inherited through faith and patient perseverance. You want a definition of perseverance? You just keep on believing regardless. <laughs> you keep on going, don't you? Regardless of your circumstances. Despite, after 10 years of believing, Abraham gave in to doubt and unbelief. But I'm so, so encouraged by God's patience towards Abraham. For from Genesis chapter 17, we learn that when he was 99 years of age, God spoke to him again. And he promised him that his first wife, whose name at that time was changed to Sarah, would bear him a son, as previously promised. And in Romans 4.18, the Apostle Paul refers to that time and says that against all hope, in other words, against all natural hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. Against all human hope, is what the Scripture is saying. Abraham placed his hope in God and in his promise to him. And Paul continues in Romans 4 and verse 19. Without weakening in his faith, Abraham faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. He wasn't in denial. He faced the fact his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years of age and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, verse 20 says, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God being fully persuaded that God has power to do what he had promised. Friends, this morning, I want to say to you, God has the power to bring about the things that he's promised to you corporately and individually. Keep on believing. Keep on believing. If you've fallen into doubt, begin again to believe. Begin again to believe. Mary believed. Andy believed this morning. And in response to prayer, God responded to that. We've seen the evidence in our midst this morning. The old authorised version, the King James Version that I grew up on, says that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. What an incredible picture. We are to walk, the scripture says, the Christian path by faith. It's doubt and unbelief that will cause us to stagger and even fall in our believing. But Abraham, in the face of impossible circumstances, he kept walking the path of faith, believing what God had said. And just as Abraham received his promised blessing through believing God's word to him, so in a similar way, through exercising faith, we receive God's promised blessings to us. Lord, help us believe. Help us believe. Now to return to Mary and her example to us. 
as we've already observed, it is so important that we receive and respond, how we respond to what God says to us. For verse 38 of Luke chapter 1 that we read together, Mary's response was, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me just as you've said. Don't know how you're going to bring it about. I wonder how, but let it be to me. And maybe the Lord has been speaking to you and asking something of you which seems in the natural impossible. Well, as we approach another Christmas, will your response be one of unbelief like Zachariah or like Mary? Will you respond, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. For remember what the angel said. Every spoken word of God has the power to bring about what God says in his way and in his time. And if God has spoken to you about something specific in the past that is still to come about and maybe you've stumbled in persevering in your believing, then today I want to encourage you, begin to believe again as Abraham did, that God has the power to do what he has promised to you. And be assured that God, friends, the scripture tells us, is not a mere man who tells lies. As Numbers 23, 19 makes clear, God is not someone who speaks and then doesn't act. He doesn't make promises that he doesn't fulfill. As the popular modern Christian song says he is way maker, promise keeper, miracle worker light in the darkness my God that is who he is and he is here moving in this place I worship him I worship him he is here imparting faith today let's worship him let's worship him he is way maker promise keeper miracle worker light in the darkness my god that is who you are that is who you are that is who you Lord, we thank you this morning not just for your miraculous coming but we thank you that we've been able to be in the presence of the way maker, the promise keeper, the miracle worker the light in the darkness and we pray as we've looked at these people that you used in your purposes that you will help us to learn from the mistakes of Zechariah to learn from the state mistakes of Abraham to learn from the doubting of Thomas and like Mary even with what seems impossible that you help us to believe that what you have promised you will bring about so I pray for any here particularly today where you've spoken to them about specific situations where perhaps the time the years have rolled by and it doesn't seem to be coming to pass I pray again you will rekindle this Christmas time fresh faith that you are able to do exceedingly above and beyond what we dare ask or imagine and I pray for your blessing upon everyone that's part of Oasis Community Church this Christmas time and as they 
move into a new year, I pray for fresh faith to arise. That you still want to use them as lights in the darkness in this town. Amen.